Houston, with your current book, Make Your Story Really Stinkin' Big, you have a chapter entitled Build Your Characters a House to Live In. Yes. Can we talk about a little bit what that entails? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so what, what's interesting now is uh, it, from a transmedia perspective, from a superstore perspective, the, the Producers Guild of America has ratified a transmedia producer credit. And they, they ratified that a few years ago. And they say you need three storylines and at least three mediums that all operate in one narrative universe. And that one narrative universe is what I call a story world. And so now, to be able to approach a transmedia project or any sort of project, we, we now need to not just think about the individual story that we want to tell. We need to think about the place where the story takes place, the world in which the story lives. And that's what I call a story world. And that's that one narrative universe that the PGA talks about. And so there's a difference between story world and story. The, uh, the, the story of Dorothy and the tornado and Landon and Oz and, and going on the adventure of the, the Yellow Brick Road is a story. But the story world is Oz itself that is much bigger than, than, than Dorothy. Dorothy is just a single story that takes place in a much bigger world. Uh, Luke Skywalker is just a, his, his epic journey to destroy the Death Star and you know the, the story of the dysfunctional Skywalkers, uh, the Skywalker family, is just a single story in a much bigger world. The story of the Matrix is Neo and Morpheus and, and their adventure trying to deconstruct and tear down the Matrix itself. But the story world of the Matrix is a futuristic Earth that's been taken over by machines and they use people as batteries and put them in a weird VR environment as they use them as batteries. That's the world of the Matrix, which is much bigger than just Neo and Morpheus' story. And that's just one story that you can tell. And so now we're, we're, I look at, at not just what the individual story is, but what's the story world that we need to build around that story. Because what happens is if you, if you build your story world right, one, it'll be more attractive to an audience. Remember, uh, one of the two reasons that Spielberg told, uh, said that, that Star Wars was so much more valuable than Close Encounters was because he said that, that Lucas built a world that, where people wanted to explore. And so the story world is a key component in, in multi-platform success because that holds the rest of your story potential. So one, it engage, it's more engaging for the initial story that you want to tell, but also it creates more potential for more stories moving forward. So it, if we put it into a, a consumer, uh, like a consumer model, and if your individual stories, if you look at them as commodities, and so my individual story is an orange, and I need, and I need to sell my orange in, in order to get money, and this is my business. And if, if, I just ha if I'm holding oranges, I could probably just only, only hold a couple individual oranges uh, to take them out to the side of the road to sell. But if I want to sell more oranges, I need a box. And if I have a big box, now I can have 30, 40, 50, 60 oranges, depending on how big my box is, that I can now take to the, to the side of the road to sell my oranges at my orange stand. So the box, having the box to hold my oranges increases my revenue potential for my venture. The story world is the box that holds your individual stories. And so some, of, some story worlds are very big, like Star Wars, uh, like Star Trek, like Game of Thrones and Westeros. The, there's these gigantic story worlds. Other story worlds are much smaller, but at the same time, uh, they can still hold multiple oranges, which increases revenue potential. So these are the things that can attract investors and attract buyers. But we have to look at the building of a story world as a separate discipline of telling a story. And it's something that, uh, that most people don't look at as a separate, sort of the separate discipline or a separate style of creation. Because just because you're a good storyteller doesn't mean you're a good world builder. Just because you're a good world builder doesn't mean you're a good storyteller. You need both and in order to, to succeed on sort of these, these big levels. But, but, uh, but uh, so in my original book, uh, Make Your Story Really Stinking Big, I outlined some, some strategies of world building. Of uh, It's not building a world and telling a bad story. That won't work because if you build a great world and tell a bad story, your product's not going to be any good. 
you know, I, I'm a fan of, uh, uh, of, of big worlds, big, you know, I grew up uh, Star Wars, uh, Lord of the Rings type of stuff, so I, I like these big worlds. But you look at something like uh, the Wachowskis when they did uh, Jupiter Ascending, and that was a tremendous world that they built, but the, the movie was very, was, was, was not as good as the world, which ultimately made the project just not sustainable. And so you can build a great world, but if you have a bad product that you put out, bad movie, bad book, bad TV show, it's just not gonna work. If you tell a great story with a bad world, you could win an Oscar, but you're not gonna be able to extend the life of the project or be able to uh, do all the other things that you wanna do because your, your multi-platform potential and your revenue potential and your story potential all reside in the story world itself. So, so now we need both. We need, there are these two things that we need to be able to tell what I think is a 21st century story is we need a great story world and great stories within those worlds. That's what's great about the Hunger Games the world of the Hunger Games is really interesting and cool, um, and but at the same time, Katniss's story within that really cool world is emotional and engaging and something that people can all get behind. Harry's story in Harry Potter is interesting and emotional and we wanna follow that, but the world behind Harry is just as cool. And a, a uh, rule of thumb that I use is if you can take out your main character and what's left is really cool and interesting, you probably have a good story world. So like we can take Katniss out of the Hunger Games and Pan Am, which is the story world, is still really interesting and cool. Even without Katniss, it's really cool. Uh, if you take uh, Batman out of, Go out of Gotham, or out Batman out of Batman, you, you, you have Gotham. Gotham is such an interesting story world. They have a TV show, Gotham, that, that doesn't have Batman in it. It's, it, it can sustain on its own. Uh, you take Luke Skywalker out of Star Wars, arguably you've made it better. Uh, you, a lot of people think he's the most annoying guy in there. Uh, so there's other characters and other interesting things that you can follow. Same with Game of Thrones, same with all these things. Even something like Deadwood on HBO, Westworld, The Leftovers. I love, these all have like dynamic story worlds that aren't big Star Wars worlds, but they're really interesting, well-crafted stories that if you take out I'm a big fan of The Leftovers. You take out Nora and, you know, in Kevin, you take out the main characters, the rest of the world is interesting. Same with Westworld, the same with everything. But if you take Rocky out of Rocky, right, then you just have Philly, you know, <laughs> and like, the, like 1970s Philadelphia, which you can see the difference, right? And so, and so now what happens is that whole brand around Rocky is only bu is built on Sylvester Stallone's aging shoulders, and you can't get away from him. And I know they're trying to pass the torch to Creed, and that was good, but but you can see where they've been limited because they didn't build a great story world, but they won an Oscar, right? And so my thing is, let's win an Oscar and build a great story world uh, around it, so we can extend and expand. Uh, as much as we want. And so in that original book, Make Your Story Really Stinking Big, I outlined some strategy. In my new book, uh, uh, You're Gonna Need a Bigger Story, then I even go into more strategy about it because what we've seen in the past couple years is, is there's, been a, there's been a premium put on how to create great story worlds from independent creators that when they go shop stuff, when they go shop a spec script, the scripts that have great story worlds are, have been getting disproportionately good deals that, uh, as opposed to the, the scripts that are good that don't have good story worlds. So if you look at the spec deal, the average spec deal say is $200,000, $250,000. The specs that have great story worlds have been getting picked up $2 million, $3 million, $2.5 million because the studios that look at those, they'll say, that has one good story in it, but this other thing has one good story plus 40 other stories that I could potentially uh, uh, tell across platforms. So I see video games, I see TV, I see multiple features, I see cartoons, I see comic books. So from a studio's perspective, all of a sudden, spending $2 million on 40 stories rather than $200,000 on one story is a, better, is a better buy. It's like going to Costco and buying in bulk. And so if they, they think, if, they, if I can buy the big IP that has lots of story potential, now this is a wise long-term investment for us. And so I just, I just took two projects to China and over the past you know, couple months, 
and went over without a script and uh, sat with Oscar-winning producers who said, we don't really look at things without, uh, without a script. And I say, well, um, let's, let's talk about the world that I built. Let's talk about the world where all these stories are gonna take place. And all of a sudden, uh, I get an attachment from a producer. I get an attachment from the biggest director in China. I uh, get an attachment from, uh, you know, another, uh, from a, a person that used to run a studio over there that's coming on as a producer. Then all of a sudden, I'm attaching all these people, and I don't even have a script. I just have this really interesting world that I've built where they see all the different story potential, and all of a sudden, now financers come, fina and, and then writers look at it and say, I would love to write in that sandbox. I want to play in that sandbox. And so uh, it's, it's a really interesting time now in the marketplace where the story world has, has, has taken its own separate spot in the marketplace. It hasn't, hasn't overtaken story and priority, because again, if you don't have a great story, your product's not gonna work. But the story world as being a separate asset, as being separately built and, and have its own its own style of creation, its own rubric of creation, that has really been coming into prominence with, with sci-fi project, fantasy project, but at the same time, a uh, very, very like real world based uh, projects that, that you know you see in HBO, that you that we you know dramas. If you have a good story world, then it has good good story potential, which means it has good revenue potential and shelf life for all the different uh, players within the uh, within the project. So in my new book, I go into greater detail because of this sort of this change in the marketplace of, of the story world being a separate asset. I even go into you know, probably 50% more of styles of creation and things that you should think about and the little tricks of the trade that really help you, whether you're building Star Wars or you're building your one hour domestic drama, uh, these are the things that can help, you, help the revenue potential of the world itself. So that then when you set the table with the world, you can jump in and tell this amazing heartfelt emotional story, then all of a sudden you're hitting on both fronts and your project actually has now has more potential, both financially and creatively. Well, that was my question actually, you're reading my mind because I was thinking with real world, I don't, I wasn't seeing how transmedia would work. If you take, let's say the 80s films of John Hughes. Sure. Fantastic movies. Yeah. Um, what worlds aside from like suburbia 19, late 1980s could really be there or the high school dramas of, you know, Molly Ringwald or something, yeah, yeah. you know, because it seems like, yeah, with, with science fiction or some of these comic book films, there's endless possibilities for these worlds. Yeah, yeah. But is there endless, possi are there endless possibilities for a drama or even take Silicon Valley, great show. Sure. Um, Maybe, maybe they're more so, but if, if you look at some of the films of, of you know, that are more drama based or yeah. even romantic comedy, sure. are there chances for world, world oh, building? I, I think absolutely, because I, mean, I think Silicon Valley is, uh, the, the, uh, is a great example, because outside of the specific characters in the Silicon Valley show, Silicon Valley itself, the world of Silicon Valley is very interesting and uh, fascinating, the way that whole, thing runs and the people who reside there, you can see more than one story than just you know, a handful of characters, right? And so, so now you're just, it's, it's taken the Google Earth view of, uh, of, of a story and saying, what I have right here, is that, is that interesting? So you can have something like, um, like Rocky, for example. You know, I, I say, right, you take Rocky out of Philadelphia. Well, if, if I wanted to try to retrofit tr transmedia around Rocky, I'm gonna have to try to figure out the story world of Rocky. And so uh, now I'm gonna look at, okay, Philadelphia, and then I'll say, okay, well, what is it about Philadelphia that, what's the most unique thing about Rocky? I think the most unique thing about Rocky is the fact that he was, he was an untrained boxer. He's not even just an untrained boxer. He's, he, was a, he started out as a leg breaker for the mob who then becomes uh, a boxer, who then takes on the champ. So he's a guy that has been, um, he's a guy that is not trained for the industry that he wants to go into and against all odds is able to overcome all that and succeed at the highest level. So then I would say, okay, what is it about, uh, uh, maybe there's other people that live in this, other, this part of Philadelphia 
who do the same thing. Remember there was a movie, uh, Invincible, uh, Mark Wahlberg was a, he was a uh, bartender who tries out for the Philadelphia Eagles and makes the Philadelphia Eagles based on a true story. Mm -hmm. That I think is a similar thematic and a similar high concept as Rocky, somebody who's not trained to go into the industry that they want to go into and against all odds overcome the, uh, that obstacle and succeed at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I start to look at the different parts of Philadelphia and say, you know, uh, there's Fishtown in Philadelphia. There's a part of Philadelphia that, that Rocky, some is, is a part of called the Devil's Pockets. It's a little like a suburb, not a suburb, but like a, like a little borough almost of Philadelphia. So then I can say, okay, what is it about the people who live in the Devil's Pocket part of Philadelphia? And, and there's something about the grit and determination of just how you, the people who live there and the day-to-day -day struggle and the lives that they live and, and what they do to survive every single day, that gives them the grit and determination to say, you know what, I can do anything that I want to do. I can be a boxer if I want. I don't care if I'm trained or not because I grew up in the devil's pocket. I know I can do all these amazing things. I can be, I can play for the Eagles. Maybe you can tell a story about the, uh, about a, you know, somebody who wants to become a ballerina that is, you know, a former drug dealer out of a gang that wants to become a professional ballerina. Flash dance, sorry. Exactly, yeah. right. so <laughs> anything like that. Uh -huh. To where now, now this, this world, the devil's pocket, this little part of Philadelphia is creating people with the gun and the moxie and the grit that, that where they can go out and against all odds achieve everything they want to do. Now maybe Rocky Balboa has the feature films, but then maybe uh, there's a book series about the ballerina that you want to tell. Maybe there's a whole musical uh, uh, extension that you want to tell about somebody who wants, to, who wants to pursue music. Maybe there's a video game about somebody else that wants to do something. And now we've identified this really interesting world and then we can tie all those stories together. Because if you look at something like, on, just on NBC, Chicago Fire, Chicago Med, Chicago PD, Chicago everything, the, all the Chicago shows on NBC, they're all set in one story world. And then they cross over. And so they're all set in Chicago. And they all cross over in some really interesting ways. That's not transmedia because it's all TV, you don't shift your mediums. But the story world of Chicago supports multiple stories of multiple people and, uh, and then allows you to cross over in some interesting ways. If you look at Chicago even, you have, you have all the great stories that have been told in Chicago from uh, the uh, Eight Men Out, which was the old uh, baseball movie with Charlie Sheen that was about the old uh, Chicago Black Sox that threw the World Series. 1918 baseball movie set in Chicago. Uh, you have um, Glen Gary, Glen Ross is a business movie set in Chicago. You have uh, less Natural Born Killers started in Chicago. There's a horror movie, like a serial killer movie in Chicago. You have uh, Meet the Fockers. One of those was in Chicago. You have um, uh, Divergent and Insurgent, which is post-apocalyptic Chicago. You have um, the, uh, the, it was the um, Will Smith movie, uh, iRobot. iRobot, set in futuristic Chicago. So what's interesting is all those stories exist within the same story world, just in different parts of the timeline, right? So right, from 1918 right. all the way to post-apocalyptic dystopian Chicago. And so those all exist in the same story world, which now, now if you're thinking as, as a broader vision of a project, you say, what is my story world? What is my, you know, if my story world is, is, is Philadelphia or Chicago or whatever, now how do I uh, explore the people that live in that world? But now also, how do I shift back and forth on the timeline to find other stories that I can figure out how to then tie in? Because then all of a sudden, if in, if in iRobot, the main character finds a there's something that they find in that world that then gives them a clue as to who actually threw the World Series back in 1918. Now you tie this story that's a sci-fi story back to the old baseball story that's over here on the timeline, and you're connecting everything in an interesting way, and it becomes a game for your fan base. So it's not always about the big Star Wars you know, thing. It's about how do I identify a part of our world that's interesting and cool that, uh, and sometimes you have to engineer that, right? And so I can engineer like that the neighborhood where Rocky grew up in as this neighborhood that churns out other people like Rocky that have similar stories, maybe in, some, uh, in different industries and to be able to, uh, to explore it across platform. Now that's just as much as a story world 
as Harry Potter. Maybe it's a smaller box to carry the orange, and maybe it's a sort of a different genre, but it's the same principles that build it. 